My name is Nicandro. I'm a spinal neurosurgeon and I work at the King's College Hospital in Dubai. No disclosure. The topic is about a motor exam of patients with spinal cord injury. How to introduce a new terminology with anatomical correlations. As we know, spinal cord injury is a very common and devastating event which affects thousands of people all over the world. And therefore, a neurological terminology is very important to describe those patients among the health, health, health professionals, even for the families. American Spinal Injury Association, or Asia, has a, some very nice scoring system in which they describe properly the motor and sensory deficit for the spinal cord injury. However, there is no easy terminology to be used on the bedside of the patient to describe their neurological findings regarding the motor strength. This is an example for the Asia um, numeric scale, in which they give a score one number from zero to five according to the strength of mo movements of the muscles uh, related to the key muscles of the upper limbs related to the brachial plexus and to the lower limbs related to the lumbosacral plexus. So you can give it the number on the right and left side and give a total numeric score for the motor score and similarly for the sensory score. You can also use the Asia impediment scale, which is the equivalent of a Glasgow coma for head trauma, is the Asia for the spinal trauma. It's extremely useful and important to be used. So we classify AIS as complete when there is no motor or sensory deficit for the level of the spinal cord injury and below. Asia B, when there is some sensory preservation but no motor. Asia C and D, there is some motor preservation being Asia C until grade two of movement. So the, the patient is able to move but not against the gravity. Being Asia D, able to move against the gravity but still weak. And Asia E, when there is normal motor sensory function. This patient of mine had the C5 to 6 trauma with uh, complete um, in spinal cord injury associated with the spinal uh, column level C5. So he presented to us with this partial movement of his upper limbs, so proximal uh, key muscles were working. However, no distal movement of his upper limbs uh, and no movement of his lower limbs with, uh, with anesthesia from the dermatome of C6 and below. So what's the Asian impairment scale of this patient from A to E? First of all, we cannot talk about without always going to this basic knowledge, which is about the vertebral and the spinal cord segment correspondence inside the spinal canal. For example, as you remember from the time of neuroanatomy, from the vertebral level C2 to C7, we can add one to the number of this uh, spinal process of the vertebra to find out what the spinal cord segment inside the spinal canal on that same level. Because as you know, the spinal column is longer than the spinal cord. From the vertebral levels T1 to T5, we add two to the number of the vertebra to find out the spinal cord segment on the same level. From the vertebra T6 to T9, we add three to the number of the vertebra to find the spinal cord segment. Uh, on the level of the vertebra T10 until L1, the vertebra are so big and the spinal cord segment too small, so it's less precise. We can say that includes all the lumbosacral and coccygeal spinal cord segments. And L2 and below, there's no more spinal cord, only um, called equina. So if, if we affect the, uh, the higher part of the spinal cord, it's above the brachial plex, which is the low cervical spinal cord. Thoracic spinal cord, it's above the lumbosacral plexus at the thoracic lumbar region. So that patient of us, he had vertebral level injury C5, which corresponded to C6 spinal cord segment on the same level inside his canal. 
meaning that he, it was expected for a complete spinal cord injury that he, he would lose the movements of myotome C6 and below. So part of the, his brachial plexus is affected, being the upper part C5 still able to move his arm, as we could see, and the, the lower part no movement because it was a complete spinal cord injury. The age of this patient has to be age A because there is no motor or sensory function from the level of the spinal cord and below. Not that there is no movement of the limbs, but on the level of the spinal cord, which was defined as C6, spinal cord level, C5 vertebra, from C6 and below, there is no motor or sensory function preserved. Coming back to that case, so age impediment scale was Asia A. And what's about his motor exam? That's the second part of this lecture, which is very important to be understanding. Uh, when this, we talk about injury to the lower part of the cervical spinal cord, which is the most common effect, especially after accidents, we uh, find several different ways to describe the same neurological status. So it's something strange. How can I have five, six terminology to describe the same neurological uh, clinical status? So, for example, you usually find that the patient has tetraplegia or quadriplegia, among other variations of those. So it means that none of those uh, are precise or properly described in the neurological exam. We proposed in 2013, uh, when we, this paper about cervical spinal cord injury, a new uh, use of the terminology from the Greek roots. And to we published this second paper, but include the whole spinal cord for these terminological uh, uh, concepts. We uh, made a broad review of the literature, we went to all ancient books of Greek and Latin origin and the papers. Uh, with this, uh, we could find that neurological terminology is essentially come from Greek origin using prefix as the beginning, suffix at the end of the words, and based on those uh, terms, could build most, we can build most of the medical terms. Even after the Greek uh, era, when the Roman took over, uh, the Roman Empire, they import many of the, most of the Greek uh, words for the medical terminology. So you can use the prefix for the neurology terminology as the number uh, prefix. For example, use the cardinal numbers of Greek. For half of the body, we use the word hemi. For one segment or one limb, mono. Two, D. Three, three. Four, limbs, tetra. When you use the prefix as para, you means besides or parallels relate to the lower limbs. Going to the suffix, refer to the severity of the motor deficit, meaning when there is total paralysis of that limb, you can say that that limb has a plesia. When there is partial paralysis of that limb, so that limb has a paralysis. We can also use the, the similar uh, term for the body part. For the upper limbs, you can use the word brachial, and for the lower limbs, the word podo, both from Greek origin. So now combining those uh, terms, you can combine the prefix plus the suffix, prefix uh, meaning the location of the motor deficit. So one limb, mono, the lower limbs, para, two limbs, d, or even two sides of the face, three limbs, three, four limbs, tetra, and half of the body, right to left side, hemi. Complete if you affect the face, incomplete if it does not affect the face. And we combine it with the suffix, which means the degree of the weakness. Complete paralysis of that limb, we use the word, the, the suffix, plesia. When it's partial paralysis of that limb, you can use the suffix, paralysis. <laughs> 
So, going back to neurological function according to the level of the spinal cord injury. When a patient has injury to the high spinal cord, he develops tetraplegia, if it's a complete injury, with respiratory failure, and usually it's fatal. When the patient has injury for the lower part of the spinal cord, the cervical spinal cord, which is the most common uh, event, so the patient has paraplegia because there are no movements of his lower limbs, with brachial diparesis, has weakness of his upper limbs. Some movements, but not complete movements, and plus anesthesia. Thoracic, thoracic lumbar paraplegia and lumbosacral area can have a paraparesis. Some movements can be preserved. Just uh, some examples, the famous actor Christopher Reeve of Superman, he had this injury at, at the level C1 when he broke his neck with his spinal cord in severe, complete spinal cord injury. He had um, respiratory paralysis. Also, he lost complete movements of his four limbs. So how do you describe his motor exam? So first of all, I have to remember, when I talk about no motor exam, we always have to go back to the, the correlation between the vertebral level and the spinal cord level. So if the vertebral level was C1, the spinal cord level approximately C1 as well. And what is motor exam? Tetraplegia. So it has four uh, limbs with complete paralysis affecting spinal cord C1. This is another example, the most common scenario. This patient had uh, this traumatic translation of C5 compressing the spinal cord with complete spinal cord injury on that level. So what is motor exam? How do you describe it? First of all, again, always vertebral and spinal cord correlation. As you have the vertebral level C5, the spinal cord level is C6. So what to expect from this motor exam? If it was complete injury of the spinal cord C6, so is there any uh, preservation of key muscles of the lumbosacral? No, because it's much above the lumbosacral. There are no signals going to the uh, lower part of the spinal cord. What about for the key muscles of the brachial plexus? Is there any segment uh, preserved? Yes, the segment of C5 spinal cord is preserved, being C6 and below affected. So this patient has vertebral level C5, spinal cord level C6, approximately, having paraplegia, means low, no movements of his lower limbs, and brachial diparis, meaning there is partial movements of his upper limbs, as you can see, has flexion of his upper limb, which associated with relate to the spinal cord segment of C5. Another example, uh, this patient had T6, uh, translation after one accident with a complete spinal cord injury and transection on that level. So, motor exam. So, before that, T6 vertebra means T9 is spinal cord because on, from T6 to T9, we add three to the level of the spinal uh, column to find out the spinal cord segment inside the, the spinal canal. So, his uh, motor exam, paraplegia. So, it has no movements. Uh, complete paralysis of his lower limbs associated with the spinal cord of T9. Just to refresh, higher spinal cord C1 to C4, lower spinal cord C5 to T1, which generate the brachial plexus, thoracic, thoracic spinal cord, and thoracic lumbar, which is the origin of the lumbosacral plexus. So the clinic status in neurological description of the patient with motor deficit is according to the extent of the uh, spinal cord injury and the, the location of that. So it's very important to have a proper nomenclature to describe those neurological uh, motor deficits. So it seems to be complicated, but it's not complicated at all. Let's try to uh, dissect this um, information. So once a patient has total paralysis of four limbs, so how can we describe it? Total, uh, four limbs, tetra. So prefix is the part affected. So tetra means four limbs. Four limbs are complete paralysis, has complete paralysis? Yes. So it's plesia, the suffix. If the patient has some movement on his four limbs, so partial weakness, only some partial paralysis, so it's tetraparesis. Another situation, the patient has injured thoracic spine and has total paralysis of his lower limbs, 
meaning para, related to lower limbs, parallel from Greek origin, which are the lower limbs, plesia, complete paralysis. If there is some movements of his lower limbs, it's para paralysis. If a patient has total paralysis of his two upper limbs, so upper limbs relate to brachial, two in different side of the body, D, and total paralysis, plesia. So the patient has brachial, D, plesia. If it has some movement of the limbs, so it could be brachial, D, paralysis. The most common, most confusing, but I hope it will be clear now, when the patient has injury to the lower part of the cervical spinal cord, so he has some movement of his upper limbs and no movement of his lower limbs. So the patient has brachial, which is upper limbs, D, both sides, paresis, some weakness, so has some partial movements, and para, which means lower limbs or parallel, and plesia, no movements. So the patient has brachial de paresis and paraplegia. So if a patient has total paralysis of half of the body, right or left side, hemi is half, plesia, total paralysis. If it has some movements on that, uh, on that side, it's hemi paralysis. When the patient has total paralysis of one upper limb, upper limb means brachial, one is mono, total paralysis is plesia. If it has some movements of that limb, it's mono paralysis. And finally, if the patient has total paralysis of one of his lower limbs, is poda, which means lower limbs from Greek origin, mono one, plesia total paralysis. So based on that, we built those tables, which you can you can find in the original paper. And just refresh, and before we conclude that the, how to describe the motor deficit in those patients with spinal cord injury. So always focus on the level of the key muscles for the upper limbs, so movement of his brach brachial plexus, and lower limbs, lumbosacral plexus. So those five key muscles goes from the myotome C5 to T1, and for the lower limbs from the myotome L2 to S1. We know that brachial plexus and the, the lumbosacral it goes a bit longer than that, but the key muscles are on those levels. So, if the patient has complete injury of the higher cervical spinal cord from C2 to C5, is there any uh, myotome preserver to, uh, to move the, his limbs? No, because all the myotomes are affected. Because we, if you have injury from C2 to C5, there is no uh, motor signal to the myotomes of the key muscle for the upper or lower limbs. So the patient has a real tetraplegia. However, most commonly, uh, the patient has uh, injury of the lower part of the cervical spinal cord affecting part of the origin of the brachial plexus. Meaning, if the injury is on the spinal cord segment of C7, meaning spine, uh, vertebra C6, so is there any segment uh, preserved? Yes, from C2 to C6 is, uh, are preserved. So C5 and C6 can give some movements for his upper limbs. What about the lumbosacral plex? No, there is no, no uh, innervation for the myotomes for the lower limbs, meaning there is some preservation of movement of the upper limbs, but none for the lower limbs. So this patient has paraplegia, para parallel, plesia, complete paralysis of the parallel limbs, which, is, which means the lower limbs, and the brachial, the paris, brachial upper limbs, D2, so both sides right and left, paresis, some movement, partial paresis. Why partial paresis? Even the spinal cord injury is complete, can be partial, because segments above the lesion can be preserved according to the level of the spinal cord uh, lesion. And the relate to the lower limbs, the origin of the five key muscles for the lower limbs, which are L2 to S1 myotome, if the injury is above that, you have paraplegia. If the injury affects uh, the segment of the spinal cord in the middle of this origin of the lumbosacral plexus innervation, so you can have some segments preserved. For example, if the injury is on the level of uh, spinal cord L4 in that toric lumbar region. So, is there any uh, move, uh, any innervation for the upper limbs? Yes, complete, no, upper limbs, normal. But what about the lower limbs? Yes, 
L2, L3 for hip flexor and knee extensors can also be preserved if the injury of the spinal cord is L4, even complete injury, meaning that the, this patient has paraparesis not because the injury was partial, the injury was complete, but because of the level of the injury preserved the segments above. This also summarizes the key muscles of to Asia, what, which movements were affected and what the motor deficit should be expected, which you can find on the original paper. Thank you.